what I understand. <laughs> okay. Okay. All right. That's a interesting point. Yeah, there are, there are different uh, beings you now who uh, cultivate and specialize in uh, different things. If I ever <coughs> uh, went for a retreat, and uh, there are different of these, uh, I think, Buddha or Bodhisattva statues. And uh, you know, sometimes, uh, you know, there's just like a simple talk, then, and we were told that if we were to imagine, we just make our mind neutral, you know, don't uh, do anything and just sort of look or visualize the image. And then uh, that emotion or that uh, energy will sort of uh, replicate in our own mind. Something like that. So no, no I'm not sure how uh, deep my, uh, this might go for different people, but uh, this is what I heard. Like, yeah? Okay, so uh, now it's 8.31. And uh, maybe I'd like parents to kick off. Hey, it's Piu Hotu and good evening, everyone. Welcome to MSBS Weekly Guided Meditation by Prago. Today is 4th of May, 2021. We are very fortunate to have with us Mante Adibalo, popular known as Prago. He was born uh, on July 14, 1985, and had his big coordination under the Thai Dhamma Sek Sunday Forest Monastery, Johor, 2008. Mante is currently the Vice President of Wat Palilai Buddhist Temple, Singapore. Mante will be leading the home age to the Buddha and taking off five precepts. Beast. Now let us compose our minds, put our palms together, and welcome Mante. What to you, Mante. Yeah, thank you, Terence. So now we shall start with the opening chant the uh, homage and not more that's a paguato arahato sama sambo tatsa not more that's a paguato arahato sama sambo tatsa not more that's a paguato arahato sama sambo tatsa Three refuges, Bhutan Saranang Gachami, Tamang Saranang Gachami, Sankang Saranang Gachami, <coughs> Dutiyampi Bhutan Saranang Gachami, Dutiyampi Tamang Saranang Gachami, Dutiyampi Sankhang Saranang Gachami Tatiyampi Bhutan Saranang Gachami Tatiyampi Thamman Saranang Gachami Tatiyampi Sankhang Saranang Gachami And the five precepts Panati Pata Viramani Sika Padang Samadhyami Aditna Dana Viramani Sika Padang Samadhyami Kami Sumichajara Viramani Sika Padang Samadhyami Mutsawada Viramani Sikha Padang Samadhyami Sukra Miraya Madhya Padmadatana Viramani Sikha Padang Samadhyami Sadhu 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 Okay, so uh, good evening everyone and uh, tonight, we are continuing the series on multi-tradition, same liberation. So in the past uh, few series, we talked about a bit of the history of the different schools of Buddhism, uh, the different meditation objects, uh, the different uh, disciples, click of disciples, and the different practices they're practicing. And uh, yeah, tonight, we are going to talk <coughs> about uh, this, uh, where are we now? <laughs> Samatha and Vipassana, I suppose, yeah? 
after the Kalama Sutta. Before that is uh, Kalama Sutta, right? Ah, yeah, so we talk about this, uh, not to simply accept until you try out for yourself and you and you really experience the benefits. So this is the uh, the gist of it. Yeah. So uh, next, <clears throat> yeah, because whatever I say, you know, comes from uh, a practitioner. That means a monk, and also uh, sometimes from scripture, right? So you don't have to simply believe uh, what is being taught here. You need to uh, try it, investigate, right? See whether it works. Uh, sometimes the scripture or the instruction might be politically correct. But then the uh, practitioner interpret it differently. <laughs> then uh, you get you know, different results. Or vice versa, the uh, instruction may not be correct. But then the uh, practitioner might have enough wisdom to interpret it in his own terms or his, his or her own terms and then practice it correctly. Okay, so. Uh, today we're going to talk about these uh, four strategies. I, I think I've covered it uh, last year, but uh, not just to prove there are this diversity of methods. Uh, we've already talked about like the 40 over kinds of meditation objects. Some of them uh, can be more inclined to samatha. That means uh, tranquility or calming down the mind. And some of them, some of the meditation objects are more inclined towards uh, vipassana or insight. Uh, kind of meditation, right? So uh, different schools of Buddhism also have different understanding of what is samatha and what is vipassana. And the scripture also has uh, different definitions of uh, what is vipassana and what is samatha, no? different definitions. And, and uh, to add on, post-canonical uh, meditation manuals also have their own version of uh, samatha and vipassana. So they are now, whole, all these things, rojak, uh, that means there's a whole mix and match, uh, different combinations of things here and there. And uh, I'll just try my best to <clears throat> sort of uh, explain. Uh, so throughout the meditation sessions we've been doing, right, there's uh, like the blend of uh, samatha and, and vipassana, right? So, uh, but before we go further, uh, uh, go through this story again of this, uh, Yuga Nada Sutta. Why I need to pick this sutta, right? To show that uh, diversity of practices work. Uh, nowadays, uh, or in some contexts, maybe in the past or even today, right, there are some schools that uh, claim you know, that their particular method is correct. Or maybe uh, only Vipassana are correct. Don't do Samatha. Or some schools say, must do Samatha first. Then uh, they can do Vipassana. So they only stick to uh, one uh, method and they you know, say the other method is wrong. So a bit like the Kalama Sutta, Kalama situation, you know, uh, one school or system is correct, the other school is not correct, something like that. So it becomes uh, to this aspect, um, normally this kind of mindset will come about if let's say, uh, let's say the schools that uh, come up with these systems are sort of new and uh, they are a bit of this exclusive kind of mindset or maybe some competition then they will have this kind of view. Uh, other than that, say if a uh, person is more uh, widely read, then I think most of the practices uh, are actually quite acceptable. It's uh, all right in scripture, uh, at least based on the scripture. Okay, so, <clears throat> so the story goes like this. Uh, this venerable Ananda, the cousin of the Buddha and the uh, supposedly um, foremost in memory, he sort of remember all the teachings and uh, he sort of went around and did a survey with all the uh, enlightened monks in his time. <clears throat> so he interviewed all the enlightened monks and asked them, well, what method do you practice and uh, how do you reach enlightenment? So after interviewing and surveying all of them, he got uh, this summary conclusion. There are four general responses. So the first uh, group of monks or the first kind of response is uh, they do samatha first. They calm the mind once it's tranquil, then they move on to insight. So this is group number one. So once the mind is calm, then they can use it to uh, 
uh, observe, no, get some wisdom, you know, observe impermanence or whatever they, or whatever they want to reflect, and uh, they got enlightened from there. So this is the first group of monks. And the second group of monks, and they did it the other way around. Right? So they do insight first. So uh, you know, by reflection, then they're able to calm the mind. So through calming of the mind, they, they use their calmness to develop peace. And uh, after some time, they reach this uh, <coughs> uh, enlightenment. Right? So there's uh, some uh, different interpretation. You know? Some say, uh, because insight of vipassana can develop into vipassana samadhi. Like in the previous series, we talked about uh, you know, observing impermanence for a long time, the mind will come down, then there's these seven factors of enlightenment. Uh, so this equanimity or the calmness, tranquility doesn't come from jhanas, doesn't come from samatha. So these are the, you know, the vipassana group of people. So they develop this uh, vipassana kind of samadhi and they got uh, enlightened. So this is the second group of people. And the third group of people, they do combine both. In fact, uh, the Buddha himself, he combined uh, the breath and uh, this uh, in Vipassana together, uh, breath and impermanence. If, if you sort of uh, read the uh, Anapanasati Sutta, the 16 steps of uh, breath meditation, the last few steps uh, do mention, uh, this uh, observing of impermanence, inconstancy. And in between, I think the third quartet, uh, I think the number 12 steps onwards, talk about calming mental fabrications, which is uh, samatha. So there's calming and there's also uh, uh, insight, observing of uh, nature of reality. So uh, the Buddha's method is actually mostly himself combined both, eh? yeah, tranquility and insight. And uh, most of uh, the students got enlightened from there. And uh, the last method is a bit interesting. Uh, of course, the sutta don't mention Zen Koan style. I, I, I term this uh, step. Um, what happened is that this group of people, they have certain doubt in the Dhamma, certain doubt in the teaching, and they keep questioning, they keep asking this, uh, this doubt. You know, they keep uh, questioning and questioning, questioning until they, they reach awakening until they have certain uh, realization. So this is the, uh, no, it's a bit like Zen. So in the Zen tradition, they will ask, uh, you know, what is the sound of one hand clapping? Or who are you? you know, some, something that you keep asking over and over again. Uh, you have certain doubt. You cannot find a, you know, a real, like uh, absolute answer to it. So you keep uh, tr you know, trying to ask and stun your perception or whatever it is until you uh, find this awakening. So these are the four uh, general methods that uh, Venerable Ananda sort of discovered. So in short, there's uh, no one fixed fruit. Yeah, that means anybody can start off from anywhere. Let's say a person's mind is very scattered. Very scattered, no, then uh, no, uh, it's advisable, right, for, for the person to do tranquility first, right, followed by insight. Something like that. Or if a person's mind is already very tranquil, then no point in trying to tranquil further. No, then you can move on to insight, something like that. Right? So there are uh, different varieties depending on different situation. So this is uh, at least my point of view. You know, different uh, circumstances require different method. Right? But if let's say you do have a system to follow, uh, then by all means. But in the, my meditation routine, I sort of try to cover as uh, many these uh, mental cognitive processes as possible, whether the mind is focused, you still can practice detachment, whether the mind is expanded, you also can uh, practice detachment, or whether the mind is scattered, uh, you also can practice detachment. So uh, a bit all around there. <laughs> so, uh, so all these methods uh, can work, uh, just up to individual. Uh, call it this uh, inclination. Everybody has different inclinations. So everybody has different preferences. Some people, maybe they, they don't like to observe the breath, cannot feel the breath, right? So uh, no point forcing. Okay, I'm just going to give another case study. Uh, probably I've given it before. Uh, there's a certain uh, monk, uh, cannot do 
this uh, Asupa meditation. No, Venerable Sariputta no, give this instruction to a new monk to uh, contemplate on the foulness of the body. So this monk is thinking, you know, trying to visualize the uh, human biology and anatomy. Doesn't work. <laughs> uh, no progress in the meditation. So he tried again, doesn't work. So he went to the Buddha. And the uh, Buddha uh, has the ability to look into the person's past lives and saw that, okay, for 500 past lives, he was a goldsmith. So he was attached to gold, shiny, beautiful things, but he's not attached to the body, <laughs> not much attachment to the body. So thinking of the body like doesn't help, you know, doesn't help to reduce this uh, grief. Uh, so the Buddha made uh, like a golden flower, golden lotus, for this uh, particular monk to sort of meditate. So he just stare into this golden uh, lotus. Uh, so again, in the 40 meditation objects, there's no golden casino. <laughs> so this is one of them. Uh, so we have this golden uh, object where he stare into concentration and the Buddha able to uh, teach him insight when the mind is calm and he got liberated. Right, so this is one uh, instance. So again, everybody has a different uh, method based on different uh, inclination. All right, so nowadays, of course, uh, the Buddha is not around. So it depends on us to do the shopping, to do the window shopping. Yeah? So we move around, try different meditation teachers, go to different monastery or different systems, and we try out. We learn, uh, you know, we have an arsenal of uh, different uh, skill sets. And we sort of, uh, you know, we can customize and see which method is good for us. So this is uh, one strategy. And of course, there are certain other school of thoughts that uh, believe in guru devotion. Guru devotion. There are so many methods out there, but you know, you, the more you try, you might get confused and get worse. You do not know what to practice. So uh, if let's say the person is very, very, very fortunate and they're able to meet a very uh, good practitioner, then guru devotion helps. Guru devotion helps. So in the Theravada tradition, uh, the monks have this thing called the uh, seeking dependence. So it's between like a, like a junior monk and you want to seek a mentor to uh, uh, look for a mentor, maybe a more senior monk, more experienced monk to be their acharya, you know, to be their mentor. So there is a ritual, you know, they need to do a certain chant, maybe give some flowers or whatever it is, no flower offerings and some candle sandalwood offerings and the uh, mentor will accept. Also, this is the uh, uh, teacher-student relation in Theravada tradition. So uh, the Tibetan tradition also, they have this, I think, uh, guru devotion. And they, I think they extend it even to lay, de lay devotees. Uh, Theravada, not so much, uh, but uh, Tibetan, they extend to lay devotees. All right, so we have this, and uh, next slide. Okay, and the next one is a bit interesting. Uh, modes of practice. You now, somebody, uh, one of the participants shared with me this uh, interesting sutta in the previous uh, series. Uh, and uh, he said, you don't have to sit down and meditate to, <laughs> to reach enlightenment which is uh, all the while we've been uh, teaching in the Mahasatipatthana Sutta, as long as you're mindful of impermanence, uh, whatever activity you do, you know, it can be talking, walking, going to the bathroom, you, know, you just be mindful of impermanence all the time, uh, then it's possible to reach uh, enlightenment. Uh, sometimes in the suttas, uh, there's some extreme examples, you know, there's certain monk in the story, I think I read in the Dhammapada, you know, there's some monk so, uh, uh, full of despair, so desperate, no? ordained for so many years, never realized anything, no achievement. So he's so upset until uh, he, want to, he wanted to end his life, you know? so sad. And uh, when he was like sort of climbing the, uh, the stool and trying to hang himself, at that moment, he reached enlightenment. Of course, I'm not recommending this method. Do not, please do not try it. Uh, this is just an example only, just a case study of a very desperate attempt. Of course, uh, you might hear in uh, more post-canonical traditions or maybe uh, monks going to the extremes in the forest, like sitting at the edge of a cliff, you know, at very dangerous situations, uh, which is uh, generally 
are not encouraged in the mainstream uh, scriptures, uh, places to avoid uh, in the suttas, but uh, no, there are people who push to the, themselves to the limit and they uh, have realizations. And uh, <clears throat> so these are the five you know, grounds of liberation. First is uh, listening to uh, the teachings, the Dharma. Uh, second, teaching. <laughs> so teaching also can help you. Um, so listening and teaching, right? So uh, listening can understand. Huh? If you uh, learn something new, and if let's say you practice, then it will be beneficial. But if let's say you, if a person listen but don't practice, or uh, you know, depending on the factors involved, uh, then they might not benefit as well. So teaching, likewise, I also gave an example in uh, one of the previous sessions. You know, there are monks who, you know, senior monks teaching in the Buddha's time uh, that weren't enlightened. And uh, they even have to approach a uh, novice monk, a young boy who is enlightened to teach them <laughs> how to reach enlightenment. So uh, teaching may not be uh, uh, the case unless if a person is uh, following according to Eightfold Path. Right? So no, teaching can be an activity for enlightenment and uh, reciting this, uh, the Dharma, like chanting or memorizing the scriptures. Uh, so repeating, right? So this is uh, one, one way to recollect the teaching. And number four, reflecting on the Dharma. So something like a mental kind of debate, uh, Dharma discussion in the mind, reflecting the Dharma. Um, but uh, meditation wise, I would say it's more on observing of impermanence. No, really investigating and see whether impermanence is it true or not, right? Uh, and uh, being in line with impermanence. Yeah, so this is more like uh, reflecting on the Dharma. And uh, number five, uh, meditation. So all this um, is actually part of mental cultivation. As long as a person is mindful of impermanence, <clears throat> then that is uh, meditation. Meditation is not about sitting, it can be in any posture. So uh, one good case example is uh, the wisest disciple of the Buddha, uh, Venerable Sariputta. He got enlightened uh, while fanning the Buddha. The Buddha was giving a Dharma talk and uh, those days there weren't any fan. <laughs> I mean, the electrical fan, no air conditioning. So somebody need to hold a manual fan. So he was fanning, fanning the Buddha at the side and listening to the Buddha's teaching. And he was contemplating, so he was doing, uh, listening, is uh, reflecting, and uh, while doing that, he got enlightened. So this is for venerable Sariputta. So it doesn't need to be seated in cross leg position. And another uh, interesting case study is this venerable Sivali. Venerable Sivali, the monk foremost in receiving gifts, <laughs> receiving gifts. His past life, he has done so much charity right, that uh, in his final life as a monk, he doesn't need to start. Yeah? He receives so much offering, uh, enough robes, enough requisites, enough food right, because of his uh, past life's uh, contribution. So uh, on his day of ordination, when he was shaving his head, he got enlightened just by reflecting on impermanence on the hair. Hair fall off and he got enlightened. So this is for Venerable Sivali. Yeah? So it doesn't need to sit for many long, long hours. So like us, we uh, been through many sessions, we think on the hair. <laughs> I'm not sure of the results, uh, but uh, hopefully it helps. <laughs> okay, so this is the uh, five modes of uh, practice. So it's in this uh, Vimutta uh, Yatana Sutta, right? So listening, uh, teaching, reciting. Yeah. So how many of you do uh, chanting regularly? Nobody? Yeah, so uh, reciting also uh, might help if you able to uh, reflect. Yeah, there's uh, several elements. So um, like uh, some of the uh, meditation objects, 
they tend to gear towards this uh, reciting, let's say, a contemplation of the uh, you know, Buddha, Dhamma, Sangha. So you need to you know, recite uh, their qualities. So it can be a kind of meditation as well. So you keep reciting uh, the uh, chant, can be a short or long verse, depending on individual. But I prefer a short verse, the shorter the better. Uh, then a person can enter concentration. Yeah, so the Thai tradition, they play chi, <laughs> they use uh, butto, a uh, two-syllable, uh, something like mantra, yeah? two-syllable chant. Uh, whereas the traditional method, you have to chant the whole nine qualities of the Buddha, contemplation of the Buddha, whereas the Thai tradition, just one word. Uh, so imagine you want to memorize, you want to practice this method on contemplating on the Buddha, you need to memorize uh, all these uh, verses very long. So you need to go for the morning and evening pujas many, many times until you're very familiar with the tune, you know, you listen, uh, then you can uh, sort of replay in the mind over and over again. So uh, this is uh, one uh, method. Uh, so I believe in the <clears throat> Mahayana tradition, they have uh, easier uh, mantras, you know, like six syllable mantras, uh, you know, they chant the name of uh, Amitabha Buddha or you know, Sakyamuni Buddha, whatever Buddhas they have. And uh, all these are uh, methods to uh, in improve uh, the factor of uh, faith, the Sattva. Yeah, we have the five spiritual faculties. So uh, faith is one of them. And also improve a lot of uh, other faculties like uh, this mindfulness. If a person keep on uh, you know, not letting go of the meditation object, then that is actually Oh, improving this uh, effort and mindfulness, and also eventually develop concentration. So once the mind is uh, focused, then uh, depending on your reflection, then there will be this uh, wisdom, uh, wisdom arising. So these are the five uh, spiritual faculties, and we covered uh, these uh, different modes of uh, practice. Right. So I think I can end for this uh, you know, theoretical sharing for today. Don't want to be too heavy and uh, too many. You know, sometimes uh, meditation uh, session, you just need a few bits of Dhamma and you try to make it to put into practice. Or sometimes you listen to long, long lectures. How many percent you know, do we need to take and uh, put into practice? All right, so I just share like uh, you know, until nine o'clock or so. And uh, I open the ground for Q and A. Any uh, questions on the ground or on the uh, comments on the Facebook? You can type over here in the Zoom chat, or you can uh, unmute yourself. No one. Bante currently no comment from Facebook. Are all uh, acceptable. Eh? <laughs> Agree with the methods at peace with uh, whatever and whoever is uh, practicing or somebody else's practices. No issues. Eh? All at peace, all okay. All right. Monday, I want to asked again on the uh, first slide on the four strategies. There's one Zen Koan, Koan style, what is that? Koan, yeah, that, that's like, uh, uh, like I mentioned in, in the Zen tradition, uh, they have this like a kind of question. You know? They ask the practitioner, uh, like give a few examples, you know, what is the sound of one hand clapping? Something like that. So the meditator will have to keep asking them, what is this? <laughs> and they keep asking us until the mind uh, reaches a certain level of awakening. That is practiced by Japanese, is it? Because it says Zen. So yeah, the, the Zen tradition. So it's uh, the Chinese have it too, the, the Chan. Uh, oh, Chan, Chinese Chan Chinese also yeah. are more Chan. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so it comes from the Chinese, uh, or India, they already have it. So they transmit to China, and then to Japan and Korea. Yeah, so these are the Zen branch, or the Chan uh, school or Chan lineage. But uh, in the Theravada, Scripture, it's not uh, mentioned 
as uh, Zen Koan, but is mentioned as a doubt, doubt in the Dhamma. So the uh, meditator has certain doubt in the, the Dhamma, and they keep uh, asking over and over again until they uh, have this awakening. So very similar. No. Okay, thanks. Okay, no problem. I have a question. I have a question. Ah, uh, yes. Um, uh, by the during the eve of Buddha's enlightenment, when the Buddha he sit under the Bodhi tree, mm -hmm. um, uh, uh, he he practiced the 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 anu uh, anu what was it? anu pasati the the breathing anapanasati the, the in, anapanasati yes meditation yeah. and during how, how that during that process how did he discover the Pati, Paticha Samupada, the, the 12 dependent origination, how did he discover that process during, during that process of, of meditation? Okay, all right. Uh, so again, this uh, is a very interesting uh, topic, Paticha Samupada dependent origination, which uh, we've covered uh, last year, very uh, deep and long topic. So uh, <clears throat> no, there are very, various schools of interpretation, some we will uh, attribute Paticca Samupada as like uh, past lines, yeah, some of the schools. Um, but um, no, there are other schools, or even my personal view is that Paticca Samupada is uh, every moment here and now. So if a person reduces greed, uh, no, that is uh, unclinging, right? So if a person has uh, attachment to sense objects, then again, then that's the uh, Paticca Samupada forward order. And if they uh, reduce clinging, right, they practice the honorable truth, uh, then that will be the reverse order. So it's every moment. Okay, uh, I know it's Understood. a very an abstract answer, but uh, in my previous series, we did uh, try to explain in a very uh, uh, long and detailed manner, but of course I can give an example. If let's say if you are paying attention you know, to what I'm talking now, so currently your role, right? You're using your eye object, I mean your eye consciousness. Also there's mental formation, you need to think, you need to see, and uh, that produces, uh, we call it conditions for clinging. And once there's feeling, then you, you cling, right? Whether, uh, no, you like this topic or don't like this topic, you know, different feelings. And when you have this craving, this attachment, then there's becoming. So that becoming, you become personality. It means that currently you are a student. And for example, I'm, I'm the teacher, for example. Yeah? So this is your current personality. And if let's say here and now, this moment, you think of your friends. So you're using a mind door. You need to produce new mental formation, uh, new sense door, new mental object, uh, new contact, that means your mind door, the image of the person. Oh, she disappeared. Okay, ah, yeah. And, uh, and then you have different feelings and different personality arise. So at that moment, when you think of your friends, this personality become a friend. So it no longer become a student-teacher relationship, become friend-friend relationship, right? So become a different being. So that being has its own suffering, ups and downs. Maybe you quarrel with your friend or your, your good relationship with your friend, something like that. So uh, there is certain uh, person, uh, this uh, birth and death and dukkha going on, yeah? There's a suffering followed on after personality. So this is the forward order of uh, dependent origination at a moment to moment basis. So if you want to talk about reverse order, uh, not clinging, then you need to apply from uh, reduction of craving. I mean, at least this is my simple explanation. Huh? Hopefully that uh, answers your question. Okay, uh, any other questions? Okay, yeah, Sinri. And then my question is regarding the chanting. So I think in Mahayana practice, we do a lot of 
we call it for how the name of the Buddha, right? Whether it's a medicine Buddha or is it our Sanasan Buddha or our uh, Sekamoni Buddha. So apart from that is one name chanting and there are some, uh, how should I say? Uh, so you, uh, mantra. mantra, mantra, correct. And they are different. And ever since I moved to Theravada, I once actually asked Bhante Hai, the first time when I met him, he said, well, just chant our, uh, the opening homage, right? And, um, so is that also considered chanta by itself? And then um, more recently, as I learned about the, um, uh, uh, how should I say, sublime attitude, and I, to me that works very well in the sense that I feel like uh, the book exactly, exactly teaches what to think. Um, the verses teach me how to think versus if, you know, in, in Mahayana, which is it's right? It doesn't, it, it's not, it's too conceptualized, but the verses that I learned in our chanting book, it's very specific sign so exactly in the what's thinking. So if I'm thinking about it, does it consider a chant too? Or it ought to be a repeating, repeating? It can be, yeah, it can be. Yeah, because uh, actually in the, uh, the language used like Sanskrit or Pali, uh, that is very close to you know what the uh, Buddha's time, what the uh, uh, disciples or even the Buddha was speaking. So that was their language. So they don't need to purposely like learn a foreign language to chant. So whereas uh, nowadays we need to purposely learn like a, like a foreign uh, language, you know, like Pali or Sanskrit, then we chant those specific uh, mantras or verses. And uh, we may not know the meaning, so we take it like, uh, you know, like a uh, different thing, like chant, like a mantra, you know, something special, something foreign. But in those days, when they think of it, it is actually the teaching itself. It's an understandable language for them. So if you repeat in your own native language, you know, it can be English or Mandarin, no, no problem. Mm. So the Buddha actually allowed... Uh, uh, the, the monks to propagate the Dhamma in their own native tongue language. Okay. Uh, just that, uh, you know, uh, out of tradition's sake, we uh, know, keep the uh, scripture or you know, we preserve the chanting in the sort of the original uh, language. So that was uh, uh, the ancient days, uh, but uh, you know, due to times have changed, uh, now things are uh, computerized, they store in computers or in books. Uh, before that, uh, they weren't put into writing. So they need to keep on uh, reciting to sort of pass down the teaching. So now this is not so essential anymore. Thank you. Okay, no problem. Uh, okay. Any, yeah. Uh, there's a question in Facebook. Okay. Uh, the person is asking for uh, uh, what is the meditation best suited for beginners in terms of uh, attention, duration, outcome of the meditations. Okay, which meditation suitable? Uh, very hard to say. Uh, there's so many kinds of meditation. Uh, so I will say uh, whichever session you attend to, that will be the best meditation at that moment. So you just, uh, you know, if let's say you're attending my class, then you just use my method law. So if let's say you attend another uh, teacher's class, then you no, know, you just use that method. So hopefully that answers the question. All right, thank you, Mante. Okay, no problem. All right, uh, any other issues or questions? If not, uh, we have a short five minute break uh, to do your stretching or go to the bathroom and uh, we can come back for the guided meditation. All right, so see you in uh, five minutes time.
Yeah, it's with five minutes. All right, uh, so does anyone still has any queries before we start? Okay, so uh, I guess most of the people are back and she's not back, <laughs> so we're waiting for her. Uh, does anyone has uh, maybe any suggestions for future topics? What kind of topic do you want to cover? Okay, everyone's back and uh, is uh, really here. Okay, so all, all back. And we can start. And find a comfortable sitting position. Make sure your back is upright and your body relaxed. Okay, and we are starting off uh, with the uh, same, more or less the same routine. <clears throat> yeah, we're going to do a bit of visualization of the body parts to have this detachment towards the body. So we're going to visualize the hairs from head to toe and wish it well and happy. So uh, another reminder, fundamental rule is uh, never leave the mind idle. It means once you finish the mental sentence, right, may the hair be well and happy, and uh, you need to continue, start the new sentence. Yeah, may the hairs be well and happy. Right, or whenever you visualize a new patch of hair, a new area, uh, then you need to generate the right thought. I wish the hair is well and happy. Because once the mind is uh, <clears throat> idle or still, it will naturally uh, cling onto the, uh, we call it unskillful mind state, unskillful thoughts. So by uh, Thinking of loving kindness, yeah, wishing the hair is well and happy. And yeah, that is right thought. And uh, the consistency and uh, repetition is more on the right effort to maintain this uh, wholesome state of mind. So my meditation requires lots of thinking. No chance to relax, yeah? Okay, so once we have thoughts of non-anger towards the hairs, then we clear the other extreme of non-greed. So uh, what we are doing is all these hairs go through the cycles of birth, aging, decay, and passing away. Right, they grow long, they get dirty, oily, sweaty. They turn white, 
sometimes they crack and they fall off. So it's a quick uh, birth and death cycle. So we go through this, uh, think of this cycle many, many times, uh, growing and falling, growing and falling. I uh, don't need to think of other stories, like you know, how you wash your hair or how you dye your hair and that kind of stuff, no need yet. And just hair is growing and falling, growing and falling. And then you need to check the uh, symptoms. That means if there's any tension and stress, that means uh, we are practicing along with craving, which is not what we want. So we troubleshoot. And if let's say we uh, practice and we get more calm and peace or certain joy arise, that means we are on the right track. Right, so if we are on the wrong track, that means there's uh, tension or frustration, then we need to apply the right thought to reduce the craving. So we use the Four Noble Truth as the uh, SOP to uh, troubleshoot. And again, whatever you experience, whatever happiness or peace, all these are just sideshow. Yeah? You can take note of them, know the conditions that lead to this, but uh, do not cling. That means do not stay with that uh, nice feeling. It will lead to clinging. Yeah? You just know, but the emphasis is to keep uh, producing the right thought. So in this moment, uh, we are reflecting on impermanence, birth and death of the hairs. If you want to follow this, uh, the Arhan Sivali's method, and you just do this, we'll do. Don't need to practice other things. Until the ego is absorbed, yeah? So this is uh, one possible Dharma door, yeah? And, uh, we also can reflect by asking ourselves, are these hairs truly self? Can we tell the hairs not to go through birth and death? Okay, and the next part of the body we can visualize are the nails. And we wish all the fingernails well and happy, all the fingernails and all the toenails. May they be well and happy.
and all the nails are subject to birth and death. Right, they uh, grow long, collect dirt, discolor, go through wear and tear, scratches, cracks, and they even uh, chip off. So they keep growing and falling, growing and falling. So you think of the birth and death cycles many, many, many times. And we can reflect by asking ourselves, are these nails truly self? Can we tell the nails not to go through birth and death? Okay, and the next part of the body we can visualize are the teeth, teeth inside the mouth. May they be well and happy. So all the upper rows of teeth and the lower rows of teeth, may they be well and happy. And all these teeth uh, go through birth and death. They change in shape and size. They uh, get dirty and they discolor, turn yellow, brown, uh, black, decay. And they go through this uh, wear and tear. Sometimes uh, tooth cavities, they grow holes. They get loose and shaky. And eventually they fall off. So using this observation, we can ask ourselves, are these teeth truly self? Can we tell the teeth not to go through this birth and death? And the uh, next part of the body, we can visualize the skin. So all the skin from head to toe, may they be well and happy. There we 
time you uh, visualize a new patch of skin and we can wish it well and happy. And all this skin go through this uh, birth and death and get dirty, oily, sweaty, and the wrinkle goes through skin problems, cracks, pimples, boils, rashes, pus, and whatever, yeah? And the dead skin keep falling So you keep thinking of the growing and falling of the skin many, many, many times. Then we can ask ourselves, are this skin truly self? Can we tell the skin not to go through this birth and death? In the next phase of meditation, we are now uh, doing this four sublime states, uh, loving kindness, compassion, appreciative joy, and equanimity. Okay, so we start off with loving kindness. Uh, we are not going to visualize anything, right? Any form of uh, visualization is like kind of stereotyping uh, in a certain group of beings. So uh, we are now I'm going to wish all beings in front well and happy. No need to exert or extend your mind. And uh, again, no need to deliberately visualize, uh, but whatever image pop up in your mind, just treat it as uh, you know, mental formation, just a sideshow. This is more like a spatial kind of training, eh? spatial detachment. And we come back to ourselves and we reach all beings behind well and happy. And we come back to ourselves 
And we wish all beings on the left well and happy. And we come back to ourselves and we wish all beings on the right well and happy. And we come back to ourselves. Now we wish all beings above well and happy. And we come back to ourselves and we wish all beings below well and happy. And we come back to ourselves. So this time around, we suffuse the entire body with loving kindness and just feeling the sensations of the entire body from head to toe. And uh, whatever sensation that arise, we wish it well and happy. So a new sensation arise, well and happy, a new sensation arise, well and happy. Right. Treat all the sensations as passerby, no need to cling onto them and no need to uh, push them away. Yeah, so we take note of this uh, state of mind of, we call it uh, restricted loving kindness. That means it's still within the confines of the body. So now we are going to, uh, how to, how to call it, make the loving kindness more boundless. So we are going to wish all beings in all directions well and happy. Right? We wish all beings in the entire universe well and happy. So again, uh, no need to deliberately visualize and no need to uh, push or extend the mind in various directions. Just a gentle wish, gentle aspiration and uh, whatever sensation that, that arise, it can be within the body, it can be outside the body, whatever you perceive, uh, you just wish it well and happy. Because after all, all beings is a mental perception. Yeah, so any kind of formation arise, all the dharmas, we just wish it well and happy. So keep generating the loving kindness, right? New sensation, well and happy, new sensation, well and happy.
So the more uh, right thinking, the calmer the mind. And so that's the uh, paradox of uh, right thinking. As the mind gets uh, calmer, uh, that is actually getting closer to this uh, boundless loving kindness. Yeah, so this is uh, loving kindness using uh, samatha, using tranquility. And uh, we are now adding uh, the insight element, vipassana element. <laughs> so we are doing more or less the same thing, but this time we observe the arising and passing away of the sensations yeah, while wishing it well and happy. Uh, no need to purposely create the sensation that we just observe whatever arises by itself and how they pass away. The uh, goodwill or loving kindness is to remind ourselves not to uh, fight with this sensation, eh? not to react. The more you observe impermanence or you remind yourself of impermanence and the more detachment, reduction of uh, greed. And the, uh, now we are switching to the next sublime state, compassion. So there's uh, we're wishing, right? May all beings, may they be free from suffering. Okay, no need to uh, do the vipassana first. We just 
uh, observe any sensation arise, right? The, it be free from suffering. And this is uh, compassion uh, with samatha, right? By just purely wishing. and then to develop insight or some wisdom, then we need to figure out how to truly eh, be free from suffering. How to practice this uh, detachment. Same thing, yeah? observe the sensations arise and how they pass away. Yeah, how to not cling and suffer. Yeah, where is this true compassion? Whatever calm or peaceful states, you just uh, take note, understand its uh, causes and conditions, but again, treat it as a sideshow. Emphasis is on uh, generating or reflecting on impermanence and uh, compassion. And we are switching to the third sublime state, which is appreciative joy. So we are going to uh, rejoice in the positive accomplishments of all beings.
So likewise, any new sensation that arise, we also uh, rejoice in uh, no, positive. Anything positive we can learn from it, uh, we rejoice. And then we can observe if the mind gets calmer with this uh, appreciative joy. And that is like the uh, samatha of rejoicing. And we can differentiate uh, between calmness of uh, samatha and calmness of uh, vipassana. Okay, then uh, we are now adding this uh, Vipassana element of uh, observing this impermanence. So all the formations that arise and pass away, any uh, form of merit, improvement in uh, calmness or understanding of the Dharma, we uh, rejoice. Yeah? And uh, we are now switching to the uh, fourth sublime state, <clears throat> yeah, which is uh, equanimity. And uh, we, we traditionally practice equanimity on reflecting on karma. Yeah, all beings are owners of their karmas, heirs to their karma. Uh, whatever good and bad we do, and we are the uh, recipients of all these actions. So likewise, all the sensations that arise, any uh, 
pleasant sensations are the ripening of good karmas, and unpleasant sensations are ripening of the bad karmas. So in short, uh, new sensation karma, new sensation karma. So this is uh, equanimity uh, or karma, reflection of equanimity at the samatha level. And we're adding in this uh, vipassana. Right, so uh, karma, again, uh, or karmic formations is actually the fourth aggregate. Yeah, we have five aggregates from feeling, uh, perception, mental formation, which is this karma and uh, consciousness, our attention. Yeah? So there are these uh, aspects. So uh, any karma that arises and passes away, just observe this uh, volition, this karmic formation that arise, pass away, and the feelings it produces. Okay, so we can now uh, maintain uh, this mindfulness of impermanence while uh, physically opening our eyes. Uh, 
And so physically, we may look like we end the meditation, but mentally, it's still uh, meditating. Yeah, still have this mindfulness. All right, it's uh, 10 o'clock. So for those who have uh, awakened, uh, physically awakened, any uh, questions or problems you want to bring up? Okay. Yeah. One more question. Like you see, you differentiate the samatha pasana, right? When, when we do the contemplation, isn't it vipassana? Yeah, when you contemplate on the uh, impermanence aspect, then there is uh, the vipassana element. No, when, when we think of something, isn't it more uh, vipassana than samatha? Samatha is more on stillness. More on... Uh, there's a lot of uh, right thought involved, uh, application of thoughts yeah, to direct the mind to that object. So it's not about uh, uh, lack of thinking. In fact, you need uh, a lot of this effort and right thought. It's all about uh, how much you restrict the mind, that's all. Okay, uh, any other questions? Uh, yes, uh, as, uh, as I was, as, as I was sitting and when when you instructed us to uh to to recite recite the the the, the loving kindness the uh, like like for me example for example I I keep on reciting in, in my heart Sabe Sata Bhavantu Sukitata Sabe Sata Bhavantu Sukitata may all beings be well and happy and mm -hmm. And as I was fixate, fixated on that, uh, on, on that um, inner inner monologue, and then and then the 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 painful sensation begin to to appear, and I I the the the, the painful sensation of my thigh as I was sitting so long, and then then comes the itch, and then I just and I, as they come, I just treat them as a visitor, and then mm. and then I do not. And, and then I, I, when they get so overpowering, and then I switch my attention to these two, to these two visitors, the pain and the, the itch. And then I just say to them, um, may pain be well and happy, may itch be well and happy. I, I, do, not, I, I do not personalize them with me. And, and, and then, but however, they, they, they continue to persist. They do not fade. And it, the pain gets so overpowering that I have to switch position. I have to switch my body. So, so from there, um, um, I begin to I begin to realize. But correct me if I'm wrong. So, can we say that the sensation is the cause, and and the the, the volition, the volition, the intention to to switch position to to move the body, and and the, the, the karma, the action of shifting the body, that is the effect. Can, 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 can we put, put that in words? Can, can, we, can we consider that? And that is uh, one way. Then, of course, we have the uh, volition to want to shift, yeah? the intention to want to shift also. And uh, there's also, we call it uh, uh, residual karma based on you know, how much uh, momentum you've already built up in your meditation. So does uh, the mind remain calm when you shift? So that's the important part, yeah? So if the mind can remain calm, that means there's enough of the momentum of these uh, right thoughts that's being brought forward. And uh, we can, and once you shift finish, then you can carry on from there. Um, how do we know the mind is idle? Like when the mind is, when the mindfulness becomes inactive, so it means that from when we begin to uh, daydream or we begin to get drifted away by yeah. by whatever thoughts that arise such as such as um like the thoughts that that, that, that comes in mind like did i did i forget to switch off the fire like uh, um 
like yeah. suddenly we, we, we remember something we remember we remember a task that we forget to do um yeah, when we get to get drifted away by it so we get slack off and that, that is when the mind becomes idle is it yeah when the mind idles then uh that would be the product we call the five hindrances so like restlessness and worry is one of them like what you mentioned you know, you forgot this or forgot that or uh, daydreaming, right? Uh, maybe sloth and torpor, uh, falling asleep. So that could be uh, the result of uh, if you just idle the mind. I see. So continuous effort is 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 the key to combat this hindrance. Yeah, correct effort. Yeah. Vir so, Vir so mentioned. Yeah, mentioned in the uh, Mahasatipatthana Sutta. We mentioned in the previous. Uh, at, I mean the series. You know the. Uh, mindfulness of these five hindrances isn't about just watching it and and letting it come. Yeah, uh, it comes, it will stay. <laughs> it will overpower you. So I see. you need to yeah. the effort to uh, to uh, overcome it. Okay, I see. No further questions. Thank you. Okay, all right, no problem. Uh, any other issues? Okay, if there's uh, no issues, then we and conclude the session. I think there's a closing chant. Okay, uh, then the dedicating of merits. Akasata Japumata, Devana Gamahitika, Punyantang Hanumoditwa. Chirang rakan to loka sasanam, Eta vataja ambihi, Sampadam punya sampadam, Sade deva, Sade puta, Sade sata anumodan to Samba sampati sidiya. Transference of merits to the departed, Eta mania dina ho to, Sukita ho to nyata yo. Itang me nyati na hotu, sukita hotu nyata yo. Itang me nyati na hotu, sukita hotu nyata yo. Aspiration, imina punya kamina, ame bala samagamo, satang samagamo hotu, yawani bana patiya. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. So, uh, any announcements from Terence? <coughs> so, to highlight uh, what they have agreed just now to uh, lead us in the meditation retreat on this uh, coming June, on the 26th and 27th of July. We'll keep these two dates available. June. If interested. Ah, sorry. June. <laughs> Not my full enough. <laughs> Thank you everyone for watching. Okay, all right. Good night. Right. For the videos, Goodbye. please visit yeah. here. Yeah. Uh, okay. Sister Wong, if you want to visit the past on the dependent origination series, you can visit the YouTube or the Facebook. Okay. Good night, everyone. Good night. Bye. Sadu, sadu, sadu. Right. Thank you, Bante. Good night. Hey, good night.